Well, hi there, and welcome back to another episode of Let's Talk Real Estate Investing. I'm your host, Sharon Bornholt, and I'm so excited you're, you're here today. My guest is Phoenix investor, Marcus Maloney. It, it's kind of funny. I ran into Marcus uh, back a month or so, two ago in uh, Chicago, and we, we talked about the fact that he had been on my podcast before and the fact that he was starting a podcast. So here we are again. Uh, Marcus has completed over $3 million in wholesale transactions. He's a buy and hold landlord using the BRR, buy, rent, rehab, and refinance method. He also owns commercial property, including a school. Now, that's going to be a story, I'm sure. But Marcus is really good at turning marginal profits into significant equity positions. So this is something you're going to want to really pay attention to. He's a mentor. I know he's mentored a lot of people. He has a, a new podcast coming out. We're going to learn about all of that today. So welcome to the show, Marcus. Thank you, Sharon, and thank you for having me again. Yeah. Well, I, I forgot to mention, you're also a licensed real estate agent, so you are maybe just a little bit busy. Yeah, you know what? I try and keep myself busy. I'm one of those people <laughs> that, you know, if I have too much downtime, I go a little nuts and find something to do. Well, I kind of gave people the short version of your story, but I know you've got a pretty inspiring story. So tell everybody a little bit about yourself and how you got started and really how you got from where you, where you started to where you got here. Sure, sure. So Sharon and the listeners, actually my mom started um, as a fix and flipper years ago. When I say years ago, it was like early 80s and I was young. I was probably in grammar school and I didn't know what she was doing. You know, and she bought this burnt out house and I'm like, well, what are we going to do with this? You know, but to make a long story short, we were part of the rehab team. And um, like three months later, she she held it, made some passive income off of it and then sold it, you know, and had a significant um, increase, you know, profit. And that kind of got me interested into it. But I kind of went the traditional route, went to college, um, and then went and got a graduate degree. And I was working in human resources for years. And I was like, this just isn't scratching <laughs> that itch for me. And I would always find myself uh, working with some of the contracting crews because we have a uh, group home in Illinois, a social service agency in Illinois, and we work with triple youth. And we would always have to buy houses to get them prepped for the group homes. And I always found myself out of the office working with the contractors. And I was like, okay, this is where I need to be. And uh, from there, we kind of, I kind of just started dabbling in the real estate and now I'm full time and doing quite a bit. So just to give you the, the short story of it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I know you, you lived in Chicago, then you relocated to Phoenix. And, but our, uh, we'll talk about that in a minute. But uh, let me backtrack just a little bit. So you started out as a, with that first property, you kept, you all kept it, and then you sold it. So what, what was your main in investing strategy when you started again? My main investing strategy, my mind was on buy and hold because I always wanted that passive income. But at the time, I didn't have the money, you know, to or the credit to get into buy and holds and buy apartments and things like that. So I had to wholesale. Mm -hmm. And naturally, wholesaling, you know, most people believe it's so easy, but it is a grind. You know, and, and I grinded it out and grinded it out and started saving my money. And then I started buying small little um, $30,000 properties and rehabbing them and just getting the passive income off of them. So my whole strategy was the passive income, but I had to work my way up to that point. You know, and I think I tell people, no matter what your strategy is, wholesaling, in my opinion, should be a part of any business because if you are generating leads, you're, you're going to get leads that don't fit with your portfolio. They're in the wrong area. They're the wrong size. They're the wrong something. So you can always wholesale the properties that aren't a fit for you. I, I remember the early days when I used to actually pass on some of those, if you can imagine that. Yep. Be like, no, I don't know what to do with this. Well, today, you know, you go get forward a, a little bit and you find out, boy, there's always something, almost always something you can do with a property. So 
I think part of it is thinking a little bit differently, but if you're a rehabber, you can wholesale properties and just use those as a kind of a slush fund for when you really muck something up. And then for buy and hold, you can, you've, who can't use money for repairs or paying down properties, but wholesaling should be a part of everybody's business, I think. Absolutely. I completely agree because, and that's what I do. I use the wholesale income really to go and buy mm -hmm. um, other properties. And with our marketing, some of the properties that we don't want to hold on to or rehab, then we just wholesale them out. Right. And we actually just did one uh, last month where I'm kind of kicking myself because I'm like, I should have kept that one, but <laughs> they come and they go. And sometimes, you know, hindsight is uh, 2020. Yeah. Well, the, well, boy, isn't that the truth. So um, your strategy then today, you're still kind of doing the same strategy where you, where you're, you have a buy and hold investing strategy, but you'll wholesale. Then do, do you ever rehab and then sell like to a retail buyer? I do, but I don't do it as much um, because it's a lot of work and it's a lot of risk. And one, one thing one of my mentors told me was, you know, sometimes you can have one property and you, you, you go to do and fix it flipping. Yeah. You may make $30,000, but it takes you four months to make that $30,000. He said, where you can wholesale and wholesale four or five houses and limit your risk and still make that $30,000 in less than four months. So um, that's kind of the approach that I take. Mm -hmm. And, and then it's, 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 absolutely been working for us yeah yeah it's a I think it's a good strategy and I know I, I actually like to rehabbing a lot but there's a lot of risk and if the market turns you you know as it did in 2008 that's when I became an accidental wholesaler um, but there it's it's just easier if you're doing marketing and and your strategy is buy and hold it's just easier to offload those properties that don't fit your criteria I think it is as much fun as rehabbing is, there is a lot of risk in rehabbing. It is. It's a lot of risk and it's a lot of moving parts. Mm -hmm. um, if you don't have private money, then you have to get hard money. And, you know, you're on a very aggressive timeline to get things done. Where wholesaling, you know, if you can just get it done, <laughs> you know, and yeah. then move on to the next one. Or if it's one that you want to keep, then you say, okay, well, then I'll just do a light rehab. You're mm -hmm. buying it at an excellent price, you do a light rehab, and then you can kind of roll it over into the birth strategy, right? You know, which we've been doing a lot lately. Yeah. Yeah. So explain to people that might not know what that is, exactly what those letters stand for. So the BRRRR is buy, um, renovate, rehab, rent, and then refinance. Right. Um, and basically, as a wholesaler or as a, a marketer, that get these properties, you know, 50, 60, 70 cent on a dollar, you have that built in equity. Mm -hmm. So you can go in and you can fluff the property up, new carpet, paint, maybe new appliances and things like that, get a renter in place and then have the bank to come and refinance because the bank is going to not only look at, Hey, you bought this property at a significant discount, but also you have passive income coming into it. So that will um, help leverage that loan. So it's an excellent strategy. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, if people can just remember that formula, you can just do it and work that over and over and over again. Yep. So I know that, I know that you have some commercial properties. I'd like to talk about those a little bit, but do you actually at the end of the day prefer single family or multifamilies? Do you have a preference? I'm transitioning more into the multifamily. Okay. Um, I, I recently purchased a duplex and, you know, just kind of running the numbers, looking at it. I'm like, wow, this duplex is making double what I'm making on some of my uh, single family. So kind of pivoting now to uh, to the multifamily. But hey, single family is deep down in my heart. <laughs> yeah, everybody understands houses. The one thing that I think is true for, for houses is they, the plus that I see is they're easier to liquidate. If you get into a bind now, you probably, maybe a duplex is okay, but if you've got bigger apartment buildings, even like eight plexes, they're mm -hmm. a lot harder to get rid of if you need to liquidate fast, where you can always sell a house. 
they they are and that's why we kind of use a mixed uh yeah. portfolio you know we have some small commercial um some apartments and some single families. So if we get in that position where we need to liquidate, we can always liquidate one of those uh, single family residences and still keep the passive income from the commercial and the uh, multifamilies. That, yeah, I think that's a smart, smart way to do it because you do make more, if you get a vacancy in a fourplex, you've got three other people to help make that mortgage payment. So there's, pl there's pluses and minuses for both. And I think it's smart to have a, a mix unless you I do know investors who they just like single family homes or they just like commercial property and it, you know that's why real estate's so great it, it it fits whatever you want it to be absolutely and like you said that's the good thing about it you know if, if you want to focus on single families you can do that if you want to focus on multifamilies you can do that you know so it's it's not a one-size-fits-all you know you can tailor it you know to your investment strategy right so some people want to jump right into investing out of state. I had a conversation recently with someone in Southern California where property is super expensive. And, mm -hmm. but it's also the, the payout. If you go to sell one, you can also make more, but you've got, you've got that whole, it costs a lot of money to buy it. So, so they want to jump right in and invest out of state. Now, what's, what's your feeling about that? Uh, I think you should, especially if you're wholesaling and you're just getting started, I say learn in your own backyard. That way, when you make those mistakes, um, you're closer to where those mistakes are so you can navigate it. But when you're when you're trying a virtual wholesale, um, there's a lot of moving parts. And if you're, you know, 2000 miles away or you're across country, it's a little bit harder um, to get that done because mm -hmm. we we. We virtual wholesale as well because I'm here in Phoenix, but we do deals, you know, in the Midwest. And sometimes you just you just have problems or issues that you do not foresee. Uh, one is recently last month, our acquisition manager um, took another job to be his his love was being a basketball coach, and oh, wow. he moved to Idaho to be a basketball coach. So it kind of slowed up our progress. Um, but we have an excellent person. Uh, that actually I was coaching before and he moved in that that position and he actually just texted me this morning and said, hey, I'm going to meet with a seller to lock up a contract this morning. So uh, my morning is starting out pretty great. <laughs> <laughs> so where'd you find your acquisition manager? I would get asked that question all the time. Where do you find these people that can just slide in there and do that? You know what? I do quite a bit of blogging on bigger pockets and I do YouTube videos and I do like these 15 minute free consultation sessions for newbies getting started. And I never thought that it would go this way. But as I started talking to people, you know, I started no noticing that they were newer and they really needed some guidance, mm -hmm. you know, so I would take them under my wing and I would I would show them the ropes. And actually this individual was a friend of my wife's friend and we had some, we had some dealings and I know he, had, he was doing some deals, you know, one offs here and there. And I just reached out to him. You know, when I go back to Chicago, we would, we would stop and have lunch and I would ask him, Hey, what are you doing? Mm -hmm. How's your progress? And then when this opportunity opened up, you know, that was the first person I reached out to and he was like, sure, man, let's do it. You got leads coming in. That's what I need. Let's rock and roll. And we've been yeah. going ever since. Yeah, I think sometimes people, they have a little bit of a problem with partnering up with people. They, they look at it as I'm losing money, but you actually, having a partner is not a bad thing. It's really not. And especially when you're trying to virtual wholesale, you have to have that. You have to, you know, work a network because if you're in Southern California or you're in Phoenix like me, I can't go and meet fly across country to meet with a seller or to walk a property or something like that. So um, our system that we have in place has really, really been working for us. So I know we talked about this a little bit um, uh, when we met, met in Chicago that time at that event, but um, so you're going back to do some investing in Chicago. Is that because you know the area or because the property's cheaper there? What, what, what's your main focus for doing that? 
A little bit of both. Um, everyone is talking about the exodus out of the Midwest. You know, everyone is saying people in the Midwest are moving, you know, like to Phoenix and to um, Florida and things like that. And I just see it as an as a excellent opportunity. Mm -hmm. You know, not only are the properties cheap, the rents are higher and um, and I'm from there. So I know the landscape yeah. very well. And we have excellent property managers in place, you know, for our buy and holds. So it just, it, it turned out to be an accident. <laughs> and, and that's why I tell people, you always have to have a little bit of luck. And that accident really turned out into, to be a uh, very profitable situation for us. Yeah. And, and I started because I was wholesaling here in Phoenix and I would post things online and I'm, I would really want to recommend your, your listeners. If you're not on social media, you really need to um, because I was just posting online and, and my wife's friend again, she reached out to me and she was like, Hey, I got this house um, that I need to sell. And I was a little fearful about doing it at first because I was like, wow, what if the deal goes south? You yeah. know, then my wife's friend is going to be mad at me and everything like that. But it actually worked. And we made like $17,000 on that deal um, because we wholesaled it with, we JV'd with the person that's in Chicago. So, I mean, gross, it was like 34,000, um, mm -hmm. but net it was 17. And then from there, I was like, you know what, if I did it that one time, you know what, let me try this. And I started doing some marketing to Chicago and my response rate was like ridiculous, you know, and then we just been doing it ever since, Sharon. Yeah, I need to talk to you about working probates in Chicago. Man, that's a gold mine up there. Well, you, you know who to talk to. <laughs> <laughs> There's a, I mean, you, the, I talk, tell people here, I'm in Louisville, Kentucky, and we, we feel lucky that we can get the leads out of the, the newspaper, but in Chicago, there are, there are so tools up there where they're online and the, the sheer volume of probates is huge up there just because of the population. It is. And I, one thing that we're running into there, like you said, is a lot of probate situations where um, the Midwest is really a hometown where people you know, the grandmothers lived there, grew up there, and then the grandkids really kind of inherit the house, but it wasn't done through the court. So they're just still living there and the house completely paid off, but they can't do anything. Can't with sell it. it. Yeah. Yep. Can't do anything with it. And we help, you know, quite a few people go through the probate process in order to get some deals done. Yeah. So I know you've got your real estate license. Do you think, uh, this question comes up all the time. Do you think it's an advantage or a disadvantage for an investor to have a license and why? I believe it's an advantage. Um, the reason why I believe it's an advantage is because I'm with a investor friendly brokerage. And that's one of the things that people have to be aware of um, is when you get your license, you can get hang your license with the brokerage that just does traditional real estate. Mm -hmm. um, but when you find these smaller niche brokerages that does wholesale transactions that don't shun on wholesale transactions, right. like our main, our, our broker, he does commercial fix and flips, you know, oh, he does, right. he does traditional fix and flips. So he welcomes, you know, that business. So that makes it advantageous for us. And then also, when you have your license, when you talk to a seller and, and they can't accept, you know, that 70 cent on a dollar or 80 cent on a dollar, you can always turn around and tell them, hey, well, you know what, we're, we're one of the leading brokerages here in Arizona or in Chicago, and we can, we can get you above what we're, what we're offering, you know, right. so you have a way to kind of um, make sure you don't throw that lead away or refer that lead out, then you can you can list that lead and still, you know, make 3% versus where you would normally just throw that lead away. Well, and that's an, you, you said that exactly the way I tell people to do it. So you can get in a whole lot of trouble showing up as a real estate agent and then making a, trying to make a cash offer on a property. But if you show up as an investor and then mm -hmm. you say, well, okay, I understand why you can't take my offer but then we can list your property. There is a definite order in which you have to do that to not get 
hung out to dry by the real estate commission. Exactly. And, and the main thing is just disclosure. disclosure. You know, you have to disclose everything, disclose to the uh, sellers that you are not representing them. You're representing yourself or your buying entity and um, that you are an agent. So as long as you disclose yeah. everything, uh, it's not a problem. Some people shun upon getting their license because they think they're hindered in, in some form or fashion. But again, that, that goes back to the brokers that you hang, hang your license with. So you think it is you think it is a good thing for people to have their license? I do. Um, I can I can think of a handful of deals right now that I've done on the listing agent side that came in as you know from our marketing that if I wasn't a, a licensed agent I couldn't have done anything with them. Mm -hmm. Well, I want to talk a little bit about something that I know that. Um, yeah, I know you have a passion project for disadvantaged youths and you bought a school and but I want to tell people about that a little bit. So tell that story. I know you told it to me, but I want you to tell it. Okay. So um, our family started as a social service agency in, in Chicago and at like the Southern suburbs of Chicago. And we would get kids from the inner city and we would bring them to this suburb and a lot of the parents stopped being involved with the kids and we started getting a lot of referrals from like the state agency, like Department of Children and Family Services. So these kids had no, nowhere to go. They were basically homeless. And my mom back in the 80s, because she was, she was always an entrepreneur, you know, she was the first person I knew that had a hundred thousand dollar a year job in the eighties and just walked away from it. And it was like, what are you doing? <laughs> you lost, have you lost <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, but um, to make a long story short, we started, we started sawing a need for these kids and everything like that. And they needed a place to go. And some of the kids started having kids. So they, they didn't have any daycare um, services or anything like that. So my wife, she found a turn of the century school that the school district uh, was either going, they either had to sell it or they had to raise it, which is just knock it down. And I was against it. I was like, well, what are we going to do with the school? You know, I see where you guys are going, but, you know, my analytical brain was like, it's going to take too much money. You know, it's going to mm -hmm. do this and this and this and this. And lo and behold, my wife, she has, a great negotiating um, spirit behind her. And we went and we put in the offer and we got this school and we rehabbed it, renovated. And now it's one of our greatest profit generators because we are running a daycare out of it. So um, it's amazing. Uh, and I'm glad that we did that. And now my brother uh, who's over the social service agency, he is purchasing another school, which is a larger school. And well, they have purchased it and now they have expanded that, that facility as well. So we're doing some transformational things in the city of uh, Kankakee, which is just about 45 minutes south of Chicago. So my roots are always back in Chicago, um, but I just love the weather here in Phoenix. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, freezing cold or hot. Yeah. Yeah. It's really hot in Phoenix, though. It does get really, really hot. But I mean, you're always in air conditioning, so you, you, you tend to live with it. Yeah. So uh, now the school, you started out with having disadvantaged youths there. Was that that was the first place? And now you, you transitioned to a daycare? Right, right. So we transitioned to a daycare and we have about... Um, at that site, we have about 30 kids enrolled. Um, and basically the social service agency is paying our for-profit leg uh, to rent that space. Okay. Okay. So they, they pay the for-profit part. Right. The rent. Mm -hmm. They pay, oh, they pay the rent. Exactly. Exactly. So my business holds the mortgage. Mm -hmm. And we lease the space to the non for profit and the non for profit pays the rent. Okay. So that was wondering how you got around like the liability. Is that through just an insurance policy in case anybody right. was willing to do this? So Yeah, okay. so 
So we have an insurance policy on the building and the liability. And then also the social service agency has their own um, liability insurance policy also. Okay. Okay. Because I know people are going to say, boy, that's risky business having that kind of a setup. Yeah, it is. It is. But sometimes if you don't take the risk, uh, Sharon, it's only risk if you don't receive the right uh, recommendations from like your attorney and accountant and everything like that. But once they give you the green light and have everything set up, you know, that basically takes or minimizes that risk. Okay. Well, this is this has been great. So uh, what kind of, what final advice do you have? It's just kind of a two-part question. What advice do you have for folks that want to start a real estate business? So, so they're brand spanking new. And then what about people that have been in business a little while that are, are stuck? Do you have some steps for them to like bust up to the next level? Sure. So to answer question one for newbies, um, I would say find someone genuine that you can glean glean information from. You always have to have some sort of mentor or a coach. I'm not saying go out and spend $30,000 on a coach or anything like that. Sharon, I consider you one of my coaches. So okay. if I ever get into a situation where, hey, I don't know where to go, I can pick up the phone and I have certain people that I can call um, and ask questions to. Um, so I would say always have someone that you can that you can speak with or talk to or, you know, continuously educate yourself. If it's right. reading, you know, if it's, you know, getting on different social sites, being part of a group member, you have to be active, you know, in really order to, you know, receive that motivation and that encouragement mm-hmm. to do it um, because it's it, it can be scary. And that's one of the things that I tell people is just make sure you have someone to talk to uh, that can, that can lead you in the right direction. And then also you have to be willing to put your money where your mouth is. (laughs) If you say you're going to be a real estate investor, you can't be a real estate investor and afraid to spend money on marketing or, you know, spend money on direct mail or something like that. Or your education. Ultimately you'll have to invest something in your education. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, um, you know, that's, that's one of the things for the newbies is to just really get out there and start doing it, find someone and then put your money where your mouth is. And then for those who are stuck, almost similar, you know, um, I found myself in a position where I was stuck a few years ago and I was like, okay, I'm wholesaling, but I know that there's more that I can be doing. And again, I had to go and find someone that I can talk to and lead me in the right direction. And that was, that was actually one of the people that helped me get started. Mm-hmm. Um, so again, it's that network. You have yeah. to have that network and you have to be willing to take that risk on certain things. I mean, I, I, I look back, like I said earlier, hindsight is twenty twenty. I, I, there's deals that if I knew what I know now, those <laughs> deals I wouldn't have never passed up on or I wouldn't have never wholesale no matter what I would have kept them, mm. you know, so. Don't we all have that story? Yes. Yes. <laughs> so for anyone out there who's done that, just know that we've all done that. So it's really easy to look back when you know more, you're better educated, you can have better mentors and go, well, I messed that one up. That's okay. It's all part of the process. It is. And, and it's a journey, you know, so you have to take each step of the journey as, as a progression and a learning experience. Mm-hmm. And, don't don't get too high and don't get too low. That was one of the things that that I was having a problem with. I was so excited when I got a deal. You know, yes, I got a deal. And then when someone outbid me on a deal, you know, I I would question myself. Man, am I doing this right? You know, am I the right person? Should I be doing this? Should I switch up? Should I do something else? You know, but you have to just remain consistent and persistent. Those are the main things. Great advice. So let's talk a minute about your brand new podcast. What's the name of it? Sure. It's the We Love Equity um, Real Estate Show. We uh, love equity. We do love equity. Absolutely. We <laughs> love equity because in acquisitions, it's when you buy right, you know, is where you make your money. So uh, that podcast is going to be launching. Thank you, Sharon, for being one of my first guests. And thank you for the encouragement also. 
uh, because you told me two or three years ago, hey, when are you going to do a podcast? And in Chicago last month, you inspired me. And I was like, okay, let me stop procrastinating and do it. And do this. Yep, yep, yep. So, and, and here we are. Here we are. Here we are. <laughs> so we love Equity Real Estate Show. And uh, for folks that want to get in touch with you, Marcus, what's the best way for them to get in touch with you? Uh, there's numerous ways. Um, on Twitter, I'm at MRCS Maloney. Uh, Facebook, it's MRCS Maloney. Um, Instagram, MRCS Maloney. And then for your, for your listeners that's just getting started, I have tons of free videos and content on YouTube. Just go to youtube.com slash Marcus Maloney. And that's M-R-C-S-M-A-L-O-N-E-Y. Okay, and we can, we can post those links for everyone. Marcus, it's been fun. Uh, thanks so much for coming on the show today. Um, folks, be sure and check out all of his resources. He's a wealth of knowledge, and um, I think that's it for today. I'll see you same time, same place next week. Thanks again, Marcus. Thank you, Sherry. Bye for now. Bye-bye.